Welcome back to the Margins of Riga Strakam Dialogue 2022. Today we're joined by Nika Alekseeva, who is the lead researcher for the Baltics at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab based in Latvia. Nika, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You know, Nika, your presence on this podcast today, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air. I think uh, we're all a bit uh, tired of you know, geopolitical discussions or these very existential philosophical dilemmas. I think today I would uh, like to take the opportunity to draw on your kind of practical expertise in, in cybersecurity. And uh, I think that we would benefit from discussing uh, some of the kind of practical considerations and adjustments that each of us can make uh, to protect ourselves better as we nav navigate the digital environment every single day. Uh, you know, the ongoing Russia's war against Ukraine has maybe reawakened concerns about the uncontrolled spread of this information. You know, I have even friends sort of sending me images or videos allegedly from the war whose authenticity is very difficult to verify. And maybe we could begin with a bit of a broader question, kind of what are some of the trends in, in the information space that you are seeing amidst the conflict? What are some of the worrying dynamics that we should look out for? Sure. So if we talk in broad terms, wartime versus peacetime or alleged peacetime before, then if we compare what information space was about during the peacetime, we could see more like um, kind of more uh, long term investments in, say, uh, Kremlin media starting launching their activities in, in uh, many countries, uh, doing uh, various um, information operations, um, probably also Ghostwriter, and others that uh, were more kind of labor-intensive, probably more thought through. Uh, but now during wartime, which um, I guess every, like, eventually war everyone took by surprise. Ukrainians, of course, because though they were warned, no one truly believed that invasion will be such a full scale. But also in Russia, there are many signals from within Russia uh, that's mediated by uh, independent journalists uh, who are now in exile, but still have access to, say, uh, Kremlin um Clo close people in mm -hmm. the circles uh, within the Kremlin uh, who are also confirming that there is chaos. War took uh, Kremlin a larger apparatus also unprepared. And uh, now that there's a fire on the ground, physical kinetic war, uh, of course there are also fire um, uh, battles taking mm -hmm. place in information space. And at first, of course, um, like everyone took attention um, to what's happening on the ground. Basically, many videos started to circulate. Uh, and at that point, when uh, many things are developing rapidly um, and, and, and there are many digital materials uh, out there, of course, it's, it's a very nice situation to just throw in some unverified video probably taken from another place, another time, we call it miscontextualized content to allege that, oh, we'll see what's happening now in Ukraine, though it happened five years yeah. in, say, Palestine, right? Yeah. So that was the first trend. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of information fog. Things were developing super, super quickly. Uh, everyone wanted to be first and... Um, well, of course, we know that there's always dilemma, like if you want to be first or do you really want to be right about what you say? So, of course, like now, uh, not all outlets that are out there in the Internet follow the same rules of quality journalism. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you just monitor information space, there was a lot of um, rumors, a lot of, um, well, unconfirmed facts or, or facts based on, say, well, now with anonymous sources, it's kind of more justifiable to not disclose true identities of people. But still, you know, like the level of certainty about things um, should have been and, and was questioned quite a lot. Now, the first effect of the surprise is kind of gone. And uh, we also see that uh, there are well, not like less developments or developments, they, they are kind of more predictable. Like mm -hmm. everyone's already acknowledged that it's hot war situation. 
and we are living in this reality for three months already. Uh, nevertheless, if we look at uh, Russia's disinformation activities, they are still largely directed at their domestic audiences. Because, uh, well, at, at first, and we saw it in, in um, uh, social media data, uh, the most trending hashtag on so across social media was no to war, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was the first thing that trended. And of course, like in response, other pro Kremlin hashtags, um, I'm not ashamed because many said that they are ashamed to be Russians or, or part of the country. Uh, these alternative hashtags also appeared. But if you compare how much they trended, uh, no to war trended much, much, much more. So many celebrities went out, uh, very outspoken, condemned the war. And now we see that, uh, well, due to a very controlled information space in Russia, controlled via conventional media, but also mm -hmm. social media. Kontakte is directly controlled by president's administration, as we know it. Uh, well, people were, and also the prosecutions of protesters uh, who protested against the war, uh, all it kind of uh, made people um, less outspoken and probably in public polls that come from Russia. Of course, there's always this level of how much can we trust uh, uh, this data, they, they kind of uh, came out. So um, that is the effect of disinformation campaign or rather propaganda and uh, campaign to convince people why war is justifiable, directed at, at the local audiences. Uh, nevertheless, of course, there was a spillover effect due to language. Uh, Russians in other countries, neighboring countries, including the Baltic, in the Baltic states, we have Russian population, of course, they can even now that many sites are banned, they still have access to information coming from propaganda channels that are also explaining why Russia has the right to attack Ukraine. So how do they have this access? How do they get it? Yeah, so one way is through VPN, virtual uh, servers uh, that you connect and uh, it looks that you are connecting from, from other place where, say, um, RT, Sputnik are not banned. Uh, another way is through Telegram. Telegram is another battleground because the content moderation policies are super weak there. Basically, every almost any content is allowed there. Of course, there's a way to report, but anyhow, like it's a place where you will find Russian propaganda and Ukrainian wartime communication efforts. Well, what's propaganda is another. But is this a new development? Because Telegram used to have the reputation of this uh, kind of independent entity that this would be where you could communicate uh, actually more safely if you wanted to prevent your communications from being monitored by, let's say, Russia, Russian intelligence services or, or government bodies. Mm -hmm. It's not surprised that Telegram plays uh, this role in, in the war, uh, but it's new that um, Russian propaganda uh, creates so, so many accounts and is scouting Telegram for um, also, say, intelligence information on the ground, and that also uh, Telegram is now the place for Ukrainian uh, regular uh, internet users to get their information from. I mean, these countries, they had their presence on Telegram, but not in confronting manner. That That is new, that now that's the battleground, because you can't have the same on VK, which is, uh, well, more restricted abroad and, and kind of uh, the... Uh, social media network for, for Russians, probably among Russians, include well, Adnaklasniki as well. Um, and uh, like Meta's products as Instagram, Facebook are also banned. Uh, Twitter is banned. It doesn't mean that there are no uh, people from Russia who are posting there using, again, other like circumvention methods to, to, to do that. And probably there are also troll farms still present and operating. Nevertheless, these are not spaces where you can go and get both um, both countries, like see how they are fighting, how exchange of, uh, of information is happening. And additional challenge for researchers is that um, Telegram is not transparent. 
currently there is no uh, good uh, data source for mm -hmm. Telegram. You need to scrape it. And when you scrape channels, you need to make a list of them, which will also be a sample. So you don't get this bird so view analysis. it's very analysis. To analyze on a wider Exactly. Scale. You're always working with, with some, some, some sample and trying to draw conclusions. And also, yeah, well, you can analyze spread, but it's not as evident as on other platforms that we western platforms that are more transparent in that regard uh, thank you very much for this uh for this introduction i think uh, it would maybe be helpful to narrow down a bit the uh, to look at the individual level and uh, you know when it comes to looking at sort of uh, vulnerabilities that we have or ways uh means th through which we are manipulated uh in the digital environment we can distinguish between kind of cyber means of manipulation and cognitive means. W would you perhaps be able to explain a bit to our audience this this distinction and the practical steps and initiatives that we can take to protect ourselves better in both of those uh, dimensions? Sure. So cyber dimension uh, is really bound to how Internet works. Uh, what are the systems behind how information flows um, between sites, between various um, platforms, assets, and so on. Like uh, it, it also really depends on your device. What mm -hmm. uh, rights do you give to platforms uh, or apps um, to use your device to access, say, a camera or microphone and things like that? So that's the cyberspace. While um, cognitive space is basically you. Uh, that's your perception. Uh, probably also some consciousness. Uh, but, well, I mean, like cognition is still when you are awake, but of course it influences your unconsciousness mm -hmm. and then you make decisions based on, on on that so that's the kind of difference between cyber and cognitive um, aspect and they are both uh, related uh, though in in different ways so on cyber um, you need to uh, be vigilant um, when you are say um, re when someone reaches out to you um, a known person and um, prompts you to open a link for instance, because um, the link may contain um, a virus that will infect your device and uh, the attacker probably can, can get access to your device and control on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, compromised devices um, means that, well, you are not uh, in control. Someone else can take over your social media accounts and then start posting um, things, let, let's because we don't know, they could be both right, wrong, just opinions or facts, uh, on your behalf. Um, there's very kind of um, widespread idea that, well, I'm just a regular person. Who would want to hack me? Yeah. Like, why am I, I think this is something my relevant? mother always says when I tell her to yeah. know, change passwords. She's always like, ah, nobody needs my information, you know? It's yeah, not yeah, worth yeah. anything. And such reaction is there because when you are doing your cyber hygiene, it means changing some uh, behavior and sacrificing a bit of comfort because it's super comfortable when all your passwords are kind of already uh, pre uh, like filled on your behalf through various password uh, administrate administration apps, uh, though it's not that they are totally insecure, it's just that you need to understand what's secure about them and what's not. Okay, uh, but um, so yeah, you need to sacrifice your comfort and then you f look for justifications and mm -hmm. yeah, you are not, I'm not important, why should I bother? But even if you are not some public facing figure, um, someone take, let's say someone takes your account and for other users who see what knew you is posting now you will look like very uh, say trustworthy like when you are posting things to your friends they would have this habit of always trusting you so they will trust whatever you say at at first for outsiders let's say you're public uh, posting publicly so uh, anyone can can read your message uh, and see that you are driving engagement uh, they may think that these are really your thoughts that you are authentic user though actually there's well let's imagine like kremlin troll uh, controlling your account and you become the uh, troll <laughs> your identity is being hijacked so for a hostile actor this would be a really this would be a shortcut because you know it would take time to 
create a fake account and kind of build it up so it would have this kind of credibility and trust in order to drive engagement, to build up its, I don't know, network of friends and build up all of this activity to give it a track record of, of having authentic behavior. In this case, it would be far easier to, to take your account with your, you know, hundreds of, of real friends and followers and so on and exploit it for such purposes. Exactly. Uh, moreover, platforms made it more difficult to uh, create those false accounts. Um, you, well, there are many step, more steps implemented that uh, make you to use unique phone number or sometimes even identify yourself in, if you want to create uh, an account, uh, which, of course, uh, makes it more uh, like it attracts uh, the idea that, hey, uh, maybe it's best to better to hack someone. And it really so again, coming back to the cyber hygiene, um, it, it, it's it's really like up to a person and um, awareness, because if you are just clicking next, 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 without really kind of thinking about what you are allowing uh, apps that you just I don't know, fun apps, face swap, for instance, or, or something else, uh, how to use device, then, well, um, app stores, they uh, do provide some, some level of verification of if app is safe or not. But on the other hand, uh, these, uh, it's, it's, it's still people who are verifying uh, apps. And uh, it's really up to uh, processes that are implemented to verify if you can trust the app or not. Two-factor authentication, as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have just your password, let's say it's like super difficult or, um, well, whatever, but it consists of uh, five uh, characters. It takes very small uh, time for a computer to actually run all combinations of, uh, say, all letters, signs, and, and digits uh, to actually crack your password. Because it's not that someone is trying to guess your password. It, it's really kind of a um, systematic approach by a computer to run uh, various combinations. And the longer is your password, uh, the more secure it is because it takes more time for a computer to actually finally kind of get to the right combination. So let's say this first level is cracked, next level, uh, and that's two-factor authentication because it's the, the second one is that you get uh, a message uh, or uh, the, the app prompts you to uh, submit some mm -hmm. code and uh, it's really connected to your device that's physically in your pocket. So even if you're hacked from overseas, uh, someone's trying to to get into your account, you will get notification. Uh, yeah, first thing you need to do is to say that it wasn't you uh, who tried to log in. So there is also signal to the platform that some hacking attempt is, is taking place. And then basically, yeah, uh, just go through your passwords. Don't use the same password across other uh, platforms because if they guessed one, they will use the same because well, people are lazy and that's what the people do, they will try it with other popular platforms. And so you will not lose, say, Facebook account, but also your Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on. And it will look very authentic for a researcher that oh, all, all, uh, all of a sudden you start posting things and they are consistently maligned throughout all platforms. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, overnight you became the troll. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard for me to prove that you are not yeah. a real person because it's like... Your identity looks quite uh, organic. But to follow up on this in a bit of a maybe provoking way, so w what would you say is the easiest way to to hack a Facebook account? Is it really to uh, kind of, is the conventional way really to use these kind of advanced computers that uh, try to, to try to crack the codes? Or is it more that because people use the same passwords, uh, you know, there are often these like data leaks on some app and then you kind of would uh, try to use uh, the data acquired on via those leaks and apply it vis-a-vis uh, -vis different different platforms. Sort of, if if you had to hack, if you wanted to hack into my Facebook account, how would you go about this? Well, full disclosure: at the beginning of podcast, you said that I have expertise in cyber domain. Actually, I have expertise in uh, uh, open source intelligence, okay, okay. which uh, in my case does not mean uh, cyberspace necessarily. So I'm not a white hacker. Uh, I can't uh, really tell uh, which method is, is best, but you just um, basically describe two methods that, that are available. Uh, so when it comes to manipulation on online platforms, uh, 
most of the attention, I think rightfully so, is on these uh, Western big tech platforms, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Google, so on. Uh, but what is the situation like on less popular platforms? So you already alluded to Vkontakte, but in uh, Latvia, for example, we have a, a, pop, a platform that used to be very popular, but now has lost its market share, Draugiem. And I'm sure that basically across, uh, you know, in most countries, there are also these less popular platforms. Uh, what is What are the consequences of maybe these platforms existing with less oversight, less moderation? What sort of uh, concerns does that raise? Yeah, well, that's exactly the tendency that also big tech platforms see when it comes to um, foreign influence operations, say again, from the uh, I, um, in Internet Research Agency or, or other troll farms. They shifted from big platforms created, creating sock puppet accounts there to fringe platforms. Uh, exactly. As you mentioned, <clears throat> content moderation uh, is very limited there due to human resources. Uh, or technical um, capabilities, um, again, connected with human resources. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, that's the place where also kind of uh, fringes of society are go kind of are hanging out. They are usually quite, um, I don't know, industry specific or, or topic or country specific, or I don't know, some other social economic characteristic specific. Uh, in terms of uh, say, abundant uh, social media platforms, as in Latvia's case, Draugiem LV, there are other countries with their personal social media accounts that are now, well, basically, um, that lost their traction because all people went to, say, Twitter, Facebook. Basically, people uh, started to using it probably at the time when we started to learn what social media is as a thing, as as right and so people experimented uh, a little bit you know like posted uh, photos uh, like now it's fine on tiktok to do si silly stuff and and get engagement well at that point uh, people did silly stuff it was left there it wasn't kind of that intentional it and and people did not think that someone will ever uh, use that data uh, about them and uh, well one use case of course, could be that uh, someone wants to um, black, well, not really blackmail you because this information is public, uh, but more like um, well, blackmail that they will ruin your your like reputation. Extort something from you. Yeah. Exactly from your past. L mm. Let's say when you were a teenager, you were using drug MLV, but now you are a grown up. You have your career. But then there is the silly picture of, say, uh, pencils in your nostrils or something like, uh, you know, and um, uh, yeah, say you're running for elections or th there are other reputational risks um, that, that, that you may encounter. And uh, yeah, there could be a um, kind of smearing campaign using this image of silly you creating memes like um, memes are very powerful cognitive uh, tool. Um, uh, that that may influence like larger societies, so yeah, it's it's best if you just um, uh, go back in in time and remember where you signed up, check what uh, content is there. Um, shortcut could be just googling yourself, uh, Google yourself and use the uh, um, dork uh, or rather like a search operator, uh, like look in particular site. Uh, for Latvia, like site, mm -hmm. your name, surname, and see what pops up. Because probably that's that's also the gateway for people to search you online. Yeah. Uh, there are also ways to set up uh, Google Alerts, and you will get email notification if something, uh, if about, something you about you pops up. So yeah, it's good to basically Google yourself time to time and see what others mm -hmm. can see about you. Maybe uh, in the kind of concluding phase uh, of the conversation, you know, uh, words like uh, digital literacy uh, are now kind of buzzwords, you know, or kind of uh, focus on uh, education when it comes to cybersecurity and so on. And I think that conventional focus uh, on these subjects is on the youth, right? Because the uh, young people uh, spend, uh, you know, the vast majority of their lives online or interacting with the digital world in some way. Uh, but often overlooked are vulnerabilities among other demographic groups in society or even other generations, you know. Uh, you know, the studies show that, in fact, it's often older people who fall victim to all sorts of phishing scams or financial fraud scams and so on. Could you maybe discuss what sort of uh, investments we as societies need to make 
to mitigate these vulnerabilities and maybe what other trends you see in this in this sense yeah you're completely right uh, the older generation is quite overlooked in uh, media literacy uh, campaigns because of course it's easier to advocate oh we need to have media literacy embedded in our education system because mm -hmm. system already exists how do you reach people who are already kind of old enough to be your father or maybe even grandparents uh, how do you uh, talk with them uh, from a position of like a young adult or say adult in, in your 40s uh, like how do you talk with people who are actually pushed uh, into digital uh, engagement spaces during COVID times because mm. that was the only way they can um, basically know and get updates about the life of their relatives uh, granddaughter or a daughter or whoever because they can't meet physically in person due to COVID and 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 so it's it's like um, steering a car um, on a driveway without having a license. You know, you are just there. You and you are surfing internet space. Things come your way. You click on hyperlinks. Yeah. You uh, see a content of uh, a person you know. So you will always like, or you will write a comment. Um, probably you wouldn't think that someone else is reading your comments and things like that yeah yeah so it's it's very important plus uh now like social media exists since say mid or first half of 2000s early 2000s so before it was uh, mostly print or or say there was a uh, there were conventional media outlets online but mostly yeah they were like copies of the printed version yep. and we had well people uh, of older generation they have the habit if you have um, uh, print I mean like machine printed it it means that you have resources it means that you got this printing machine because you're having this media enterprise which means that you also have a staff of uh, journalists who are writing you have editor who checked uh, the content so when you get this printed word there was some due diligence done on your behalf. Now, on the web, all text is print. It looks like print, yeah. though like it could be just one person who is sharing his or her um, opinion presented as fact. And there is, there is no filter. Um, and these people weren't trained to do any information filtering. Okay, we can also compare... Um, people coming from, say, Soviet Union, where information exchange was uh, much different from, say, Western countries mm -hmm. uh, who developed an, and uh, printed word media, the fourth estate, which uh, facilitates public debate. Like, like it's, it's different. But now it's, it's kind of all uh, online. Uh, plus, there are no geographical boundaries between countries. It's it's only language and even language is erased because you can use automatic translations. Of course, we can debate about their quality, but still you can get content from say India, a uh, very kind of marginal group, or um, I don't know, also that's how radical extremists uh, uh, emerge in say uh, Latvian countryside because they have access without any geographical boundaries. And there is this kind of cognitive trust in printed word. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, like also with age, uh, psychologists can explain it better, uh, but our cognition is also like very developed. We have a lot of experience, uh, which means that we also have a lot of shortcuts of how we process information or new ideas or events that are happening. And it's much different from how young people use information, process it, and add it to their still developing brain. Let's put it this way. So yeah, we are lacking uh, this quite targeted educational campaign directed at older generation. Well, as, as they say, whether we like it or not, each of us is, uh, you know, a participant in, uh, in information warfare and in the, in the digital world. So this is, this is certainly a challenge that uh, all, all generations will, will continue to grapple with. Nika, thank you so much for joining us, for really giving some tangible advice. I think, uh, I think it was immensely useful. Thank you. Thank you.